With unlimited access to 10,000 plus workouts from world-class studios and trainers, Lululemon Studio is everything you need to be your best. Take a class in cardio, strength, yoga, dance, boxing, stretch, or any of our 60 plus class types. Or get an exclusive offer to work out at one of our U.S. participating partner studio locations, including Pure Bar, Rumble, Y7 Studio, and more. The mirror is the center of your Lululemon Studio membership. See your reflection alongside your trainer in a full HD display and track your metrics, all in an elegant design that fits any space in your home. Visit lululemonstudio.com and use code CADEN700 to experience Lululemon Studio in your home for just $795. Experience Lululemon Studio in your home and change the way you work out by visiting lululemonstudio.com and use code CADEN700 at checkout. Full price last offer 10 4 Lululemon Studio content features and member benefits subject to change. This is a Vault Studios production. Hi, this is Will Johnson with True Crime Chronicles. This week on the show, we wanted to share a true crime story from the Pacific Northwest. It's a story that took place back in the 1850s about a woman who killed her husband with an axe. It's also the first episode of a new podcast from our partner station, KGW, and reporter Ashley Corslin. You can listen to more of these stories in coming weeks by following Wicked West wherever you listen to podcasts. The wood crackled in the fire while little embers danced in the glow above the hearth. The flames were just big enough to heat the small log cabin. On that late spring evening of 1854, the Lamb family gathered inside around the dinner table for a meal. Nathaniel Lamb sat at the head of the table. A hunter and farmer, he excitedly shared the tale of his hunt earlier that day. He had shot a bear, which would provide enough meat to last his family of six for some time. As he spoke, Nathaniel's wife, Charity, gently rocked their newborn baby in her arms. She got up to tend a loaf of bread that was warming by the fire. The couple's three oldest children, Abraham, age 13, Thomas, 9, and Marianne, 19, listened with such fascination to their father's story, no one noticed when Charity quietly slipped outside the front door of the log cabin. The family was fairly secluded in the countryside of the New Oregon Territory, where they had now resided for the past 18 months. They settled here after making the brutal six-month expedition on the Oregon Trail. As the family ate supper and Nathaniel boasted about his successful kill hours prior, Charity silently tiptoed back inside. Her calculated footsteps made the wood floors creak beneath her feet ever so slightly. In one arm, she held onto her baby, Presley. In the other, she clutched an axe she had retrieved from a woodpile outside. As Nathaniel carried on, only pausing to take bites of his meal, Charity raised the axe high over his head. She slammed it down into the back of his skull. Then, she raised the axe once more and delivered a final blow deep into the top of his head. I'm Ashley Korslin, and this is Wicked West. Episode 1, The Axe Murderess. Both blows of the axe pierced Nathaniel Lamb's skull and would prove to be fatal, eventually. This gruesome act would garner Charity Lamb the title, Oregon's first recorded murderess. She was the first woman ever in the Oregon Territory charged with murder and would be the first woman tried for murder. We sat down with Carrie Timchuk, the executive director of the Oregon Historical Society, to learn more about this story. As crimes go back then, you know, there was probably uh, theft and uh, maybe some horse wrestling. Uh, but to have a woman charged with murder was astonishing. Inside the cabin that Saturday night, Nathaniel Lamb collapsed to the floor where he began bleeding out. 
Charity took off running, away from their home and into the woods, as fast as she could. Their cabin was isolated in the countryside. The nearest neighbors, the Smith family, lived a half a mile due north. When she arrived, panting and out of breath, Charity pounded on the front door. She was greeted quickly by the Smiths, who welcomed her inside and agreed to let her stay the night. Charity had an odd way of describing what she had just done to her husband and the father of her children. Basically told uh, the neighbor what she had done and that she meant to harm the critter and not to kill him. While Charity presented her version of events to the Smiths in front of a burning fire, Nathaniel was being tended to back at the lamb's cabin. A doctor had arrived, presumably after one of the children ran for help. I mean, after this happened, of course, uh, a doctor, others were told to rush to the house, to the, to the lamb cabin, uh, where Mr. Lamb would stay there in his bed for a week when he, when he would eventually pass away. But he was well enough to, to tell what happened. Uh, the children, the two boys also told what happened. Incredibly, Nathaniel lived for seven days after the attack. While on his deathbed, he mustered enough strength to tell authorities what had happened, how his beloved had swung an axe into his head, twice. He died on May 20th of 1854. Almost immediately, a coroner's inquest began. A local justice of the peace, a man named Joseph Church, served as both the town's doctor and coroner. After having dressed Nathaniel's wounds while he was alive, Church now had the duty of preparing the body for burial. He clothed Nathaniel in his Sunday best, had him placed in a coffin, and buried him. Church also took the remaining lamb children into his care while Charity awaited her fate. Not a lot is known about the Lamb family before they arrived in Oregon. Records indicate Charity Lamb, whose maiden name was Robbins, was born in either 1814 or 1818. That would have made her between 36 and 40 years old at the time of her husband's murder. Nathaniel was born in 1820, which would have made him about 34 when he died. The two had married in Randolph County, North Carolina, nearly 20 years before moving to the Oregon Territory. They came out west in 1852 in search of a better life for their growing family. Nathaniel secured a parcel of land, several hundred acres, through the Oregon Land Claim Act, which granted land to every white settler. There, the Lambs built a modest cabin along the Clackamas River, some 10 miles outside of Portland. There was no state government yet. And there was a territorial government, which was run by the federal government, a U.S. marshal appointed by the president, judges appointed by the president of the United States. Uh, but again, the entire population of Oregon was you know, maybe five, ten thousand 10,000 back then, spread out throughout the entire state. Again, with Portland at 800 being the largest city and very minimal roads. Uh, very minimal, what you need to survive in human life. They didn't have much back then. And it was a, you know, a very rugged rural time. The family wasn't well-to-do. They had little money and survived by farming. What they cooked and ate, they had to grow or hunt. Life was tough in the new territory, but it was especially difficult for women. There's no, there's no electricity. There's no running water. There's none of these conveniences that we have today, and they're raising four children and also keeping the house and cooking uh, open, you know, over an open fire and putting up with your husband, uh, which was tough for a lot of women back then. Husbands were often uh, ne'er-do-wells, and it, it, was, it was a rough life. Women held little to no rights in the 1850s. They wouldn't be able to vote in Oregon until 1912. Uh, you were often property, a little more than property. So the news of a wife murdering her husband with an axe in front of the couple's young children was a wildly shocking and salacious story for people in town. They were incensed. Newspapers splashed Charity's name across the front pages. Words like monster, inhuman, and cold-blooded stuck out in bold print. The murder became a spectacle and source of gossip. 
but also led to a fevered debate that split public opinion about Charity and her actions. The newspapers back then were abuzz with this. Uh, some violently against her, calling her names. Some, you know, a little more balanced, take, perhaps taking her side. But obviously this was, uh, you know, fodder for uh, today would have been the tabloids. And, and back then, a lot of the newspapers were very tabloidy. And so this was a story you can imagine that went through the Oregon Territory a buzz. The drama only intensified when Charity's teenage daughter, Mary Ann, was also taken into custody for the murder. Why, you might ask? Because of a scandal, of course. An alleged love triangle. As the story evolves over time, uh, why did she do this? Uh, well, some thought perhaps because a man had been in town recently, uh, living nearby uh, from California, and there was talk that he had developed a romantic interest in both Charity and Marianne, her 19-year-old daughter, and that both were interested in him romantically as well. The man's name was Mr. Collins. As the story goes, Collins had lived in town and even stayed with the Lambs on occasion. He reportedly developed a relationship with both Charity and Mary Ann. Collins eventually left for California, but before he did, he formed a plan with the women. Charity and Mary Ann would leave their family behind and relocate with Collins to California. Uh, and Charity had written a letter uh, to, to, to put in the post saying that they were anxious to hear more and were waiting to leave, waiting his instructions. The only problem, Nathaniel Lamb discovered the affair and his wife and daughter's plan. And Nathaniel had found that letter and had never mailed it. So little more is known beyond that, that uh, what the plan was, but that there was talk in the community uh, that uh, she and Marianne were going to go off to California. This alleged love triangle proved to be the perfect pretense for motive, according to prosecutors. Less than two months after Nathaniel's death, a grand jury issued two indictments for murder, one for Mary Ann and one for Charity. Mary Ann, just a teenager at the time, immediately went on trial, even though she didn't physically kill her father. Not having a job or any means to afford legal counsel, Mary Ann was appointed two attorneys through the court. She entered a plea of not guilty, and a jury was assembled to hear the case. She was initially brought to trial as, as being part of this conspiracy. A one-day trial it lasted only one day. But with little to no evidence to show Mary Ann had any direct involvement in Nathaniel's murder, it didn't take long for the jury to return a not guilty verdict. There was no evidence against her. There was nobody to testify that she had been part of this. The boys, her brothers, testified that she had no, she did not grab an axe. She had nothing to do with it. Marianne was acquitted, but her mother wouldn't get off so easily. Science proves your best sleep is vital to your mental, emotional, and physical health. The Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed senses your movements and automatically adjusts to help keep you both effortlessly comfortable. And it's temperature balancing, so you stay cool. So you're at your best for yourself and those you care about most. Life-changing sleep, only from Sleep Number. Don't miss our weekend special. The Queen Sleep Number 360 C2 Smart Bed is only $9.99, plus special financing ends Monday. To learn more, go to sleepnumber.com. Special financing subject to credit approval. Minimum monthly payments required. See store for details. Okay, the kids are already asking what's for dinner. But breaking news, empty fridge. That's okay. I'll Instacart. Let's add some organic asparagus and some farm fresh chicken. Easy. Wait, is the oldest vegetarian this week or was it gluten-free? Gluten-free pasta. Covered either way. Cart it. And finally, some vegetarian gluten-free olives for my well-earned cocktail. When your family's shopping list has more footnotes than groceries, the world is your cart. Visit instacart.com or download the app and get free delivery on your first order. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum order $10. Delivery subject to availability. Additional terms apply. Charity Lamb remained in jail for four months pending her murder trial. During that time, she was transported by wagon some 30 miles from home and across a river to a jail in a nearby county. Deputies fiercely guarded her to make sure Charity wouldn't escape. 
While at the jail, she received medical care for physical and mental problems, although what that entailed is unclear. By September 11th of 1854, Charity was brought back to Oregon City for her trial. While women weren't immune to committing crimes in the mid-1800s, Charity would be the first woman to go on trial for murder in the new Oregon Territory, and a charge of first-degree murder came with a potential punishment of death. The court procured 18 people for jury selection and questioned them heavily about their potential bias toward a female defendant. Could they remain neutral, or would they be influenced by the fact that a woman and mother was accused of such a heinous crime? Would they be too sympathetic? By the time jury selection commenced, only six people out of the 18 interviewed were chosen. The court needed 12. It was common practice at the time for remaining jurors to be selected from the crowds that gathered outside the courthouse to watch the proceedings. That's what officials did for Charity's trial. With that, the remaining six jurors were chosen. The entire jury was made up of men. No women were allowed to serve, not even in the trial of other women. This was one of the very first trials. Here again is Carrie Timchuk with the Oregon Historical Society. Of course, everybody she dealt with in the entire legal process was a man. From the police, you know, to the judge, to the lawyers, to the jury, to the jailers. Um, you know, throughout the legal process, she was the only woman involved. There was no women that ever dealt with it. There was no matron for the women prisoners. There was, of course, no female attorneys. There was no female judge. Uh, it was completely male-dominated. The cards seemed stacked against Charity as the trial began. Her lawyers flanked her sides as she took her place in the courtroom. Like her daughter Mary Ann, Charity also entered a not guilty plea. A local newspaper wrote about her appearance, saying, quote, The prisoner was brought into court carrying an infant in her arms. She was pale and sallow and as emaciated as a skeleton, apparently 50 years of age, though probably a little younger. Her clothing was thin and scanty and much worn and torn and far from clean. And her child looked exactly like the child of such a mother. Charity had a sad, abstracted, and downcast look and appeared to take no interest in the proceedings, end quote. The trial would last six days, an inordinate length of time for that era. With Charity's charge of first-degree murder, the prosecutor had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she not only killed her husband, Nathaniel, but she intended to do it, that she had planned it. First up to testify was the coroner. He described Nathaniel's injuries from the axe. One wound to the top of his head, a five-inch long cut, went through the top of his skull and two inches into his brain. The second wound also penetrated the skull. Next up were the lamb children. Charity's son, Abraham, described watching his father drop to the floor and how he and his younger brother helped him up. And the constable who had taken Charity to jail testified to the court how Charity had remarked she was sorry she had not struck Nathaniel a little harder. Then the prosecutor introduced the alleged motive, the letter that Charity and Marianne had written to Collins, their love interest, a week before the murder. A local paper described Collins as an amorist known to have caused at least one other divorce in the area. The actual letter from the women was not procured during the trial, but the prosecutor told the jury that it was a love letter to Collins, detailing the trio's plotted escape to California. But before Charity could mail the letter to Collins, Nathaniel intercepted it. As he read it, he became increasingly upset. Marianne grabbed the paper from her father's hands and ripped it up. After that, argued the prosecutor, Charity got to planning her husband's murder. He told the jury that this was no accidental killing or one fueled by impulse or passion. This was calculated, cold-blooded, and planned. Charity wanted out of this destitute, pioneering life. The nearest town was almost nine miles by wagon to the west. 
And after six months on the Oregon Trail and now 18 months living on the Oregon frontier, she was isolated, away from family, friends, and any dose of familiarity. Charity was trapped, and the only way out was to rid herself of her overbearing husband. During the trial, the press made a monster out of Charity, while reporters wrote fondly about Nathaniel. An article from the Oregon Weekly Times said, quote, Lamb was an industrious and quiet citizen and had a good claim, which he had improved considerably with his own hands, end quote. Things were not looking good for Charity Lamb. After the prosecution rested, Charity Lamb's defense team presented its case to the court. They started by addressing the alleged affair between Charity and Mr. Collins. Charity vehemently denied having any sort of relationship with him. She claimed it was her daughter who was involved romantically with Collins. Charity said she was supportive of the relationship between the two, and since Marianne had little schooling and didn't know how to read or write, Charity agreed to write the now infamous letter to Collins on behalf of Marianne. Then, attorneys introduced their strategy they hoped would lead to an acquittal for Charity. It was a combination of two legal defenses, insanity and self-defense. She would have been charged with first-degree murder, and the punishment required for first-degree murder was death. And so she would have been the first woman put to death here in Oregon with with the death penalty. Uh, They were trying to avoid that. First, attorneys presented a narrative about Nathaniel Lamb that would attempt to excuse Charity's actions. They portrayed Nathaniel as a violent abuser. As testimony would come out during the trial, uh, Nathaniel was very abusive. Abusive language to her, threatened her frequently, threatened to shoot her, um, treated her like a servant as opposed to a wife, and very, very abusive. Even on the night she hit Nathaniel with the axe, Charity reportedly told her neighbors she was afraid her husband would come after her and kill them all. No woman had been tried for murder. There was not any battered wife syndrome back then. There was no you know, self-defense for women back then against their husband. They put uh, evidence on, testimony on, from the children and from others in the community that he had threatened her, that he had hit her with a hammer, thrown a hammer at her, that he was going to come home and kill her before she could get off to California to see this Collins guy. Uh, Lots of testimony that he had been, A, been abusive, and B, had and still had been threatening to her. Charity feared for her own life and was forced to protect herself. That's what her attorneys hoped to impress upon the jury. But they also tried a secondary strategy. Attorneys claimed that Charity was more or less deranged and didn't comprehend the moral wrongness of the attack. Therefore, she certainly would not have been capable of a premeditated crime. So they argued more or less insanity. Uh, that she did not know, uh, understand the repercussions of what she was doing. Uh, They argued that, again, that she didn't have enough mental capabilities to plan this. It was uh, in a heat of passion, as opposed to premeditated. In the 1850s, there was no formal diagnosis of mental illness beyond notions of demonic possession, for which exorcism was commonly performed as a treatment. And almost anyone who was deemed mentally ill was placed into an insane asylum. But the law did acknowledge insanity as a complete defense to crimes of intent. It was believed that those who were insane did not know right from wrong. Charity's attorneys argued she had no moral comprehension of her actions the night she swung the axe into her husband's head. But they were unable to produce a witness or doctor who could definitively say whether Charity was clinically insane. Nonetheless, they argued she must be acquitted. With that, the jury was sequestered for deliberations. Uh, the, the jury goes out and who knows you know, what happened in the jury room, but they initially come back with a question for the judge. They wanted to know what imminent danger meant because he had instructed them that if they believed she had been in imminent danger of being harmed or losing her life, then self-defense would have been an excuse. 
And you could see that the judge was looking for a way to help Charity, a sense that there was some sympathy there for her. But the judge, by law, was required to say that imminent danger meant just that, imminent danger, that you thought right then that you were, your life was in danger and also that you had no way out, that you could not have escaped from the danger. After weighing the facts of the case, the jury determined that Charity could have escaped from her cabin and gotten away from Nathaniel the night she struck him. As he ate his dinner, Nathaniel was not an immediate threat to Charity's life. The jury declared that while she may have been overcome with anxiety and fear and was possibly correct in foreseeing an inevitable threat from her husband, the danger was not imminent. So although they tried, you could tell the jury was trying, uh, they, they couldn't find a way out. And so they came back with a conviction and asking the judge for mercy. Jurors reluctantly found Charity guilty, but given the circumstances of the crime, and Nathaniel's alleged abuse, jurors pleaded for a more merciful sentence. Charity's attorneys acknowledged that while her mental state might not have amounted to insanity, they too argued it was reasonable to amend the punishment to something more lenient. So what did the judge do? Did the judge take mercy on her? The judge took the mercy that he could, and he sentenced her to life in prison. He did not sentence her to death. He sentenced her to life in prison. After the trial, Charity's baby was taken from her. With no parents to care for them, the Lamb children were put up for adoption. Charity was transported to the all-male territorial penitentiary in Portland. Her cell had little more than a cot inside. She quickly became known as Oregon's first woman prisoner. And what would that have been like for no, a woman well, to be in jail uh, at that point? Well, she was the only woman prisoner. Uh, it was all males in prison. She was the only woman there, so she was kept, obviously, in her own cell. But jails in the 1850s was not a penthouse. You can imagine it was not a very pleasant place to be. Uh, they did require, uh, occasionally, people were brought in to see jails so they could see that they weren't inhumane or whatever. But you can imagine how dark, depressing they were. Uh, it, there were also workhouses. Uh, prisoners were expected to work. Uh, and the male prisoners there would probably do, you know, road work or construction. Charity was assigned to laundry duty. She spent her days washing the clothing of other prisoners and the warden's family. And as the only female inmate, Charity garnered her own sort of infamy. Rumors were rampant that she had attempted to poison her fellow prisoners by grinding up glass into their food. Newspapers even wrote about it, featuring interviews with a man from the prison who called Charity one of the worst she-devils he ever met. Eventually, it seemed, Charity's reputation as a depraved and sadistic killer grew to near mythical proportions. No one knows for sure if she ever really tried to kill other inmates or if those rumors were born out of a mixture of fear, sexism, and sensationalism. Charity spent eight years in prison before being transferred to Portland's Hawthorne Asylum in 1862, where she stayed for 15 years. Throughout her time in custody, Charity was said to have never shown remorse for killing her husband. And, and you could tell as time went on that she may have been losing touch uh, with reality, but uh, sometimes denied it, sometimes, you know, admitted it. Uh, but never really apologized for it. Charity Lamb died at the asylum in 1879. She was roughly 65 years old. Her body was buried at Portland's Lone Fir Cemetery. According to reports, her grave was one of many that were paved over in 1930. And today, that's where Oregon's first murderess rests in relative obscurity. On the next episode of Wicked West. And Gallagher said, yeah, he's dead, and I was there, but it wasn't me. A drifter accused of murdering a farmer in the late 1800s is sentenced to death. He finally realized that nobody's coming to rescue me. 
he becomes the first person to be legally hanged in the area. It was not a solemn occasion. If you've ever seen movies where it's, it's a public holiday, that's exactly what it was. And the execution. They put the noose around his neck. Turns into a spectacle. They positioned him over the trap door. For the hundreds of townspeople who bought tickets for a front row seat. Uh, he tried escaping and the sheriff and all of his guards uh, had to wrestle him to the ground. The sheriff actually told Gallagher, why don't you just take this like a man? That's next time on Wicked West. Special thanks to the Oregon Historical Society and Executive Director Carrie Timchuk for their assistance with this episode. For more information about the work of OHS, visit ohs.org. Our thanks to KGW reporter and host Ashley Corsland for bringing us today's episode. If you'd like to hear more tales of old-time true crime and the dark side of history, check out Wicked West from KGW and Vault Studios. Follow wherever you listen to podcasts. Upcoming episodes include the case of Edward Gallagher, the first man to be legally hanged in Clark County, Washington, and the case of a grave robbery gone horribly wrong. For True Crime Chronicles, I'm Will Johnson. We'll be back next week with a new case and a new story.